Wintags, Marketing Director for the Water Additives Business in North America. And today, Brentag is very pleased to present this webinar on the treatment of oily waste. Hopefully, everyone who wanted to participate is here and ready to go. I think we'll probably have more people coming in in the next five minutes or so, but we're going to go ahead and, and uh, kick things off. This is one of many webinars that Brentag plans to present. Uh, we want to bring knowledge to our customers and help them improve the quality of service that they, in turn, bring to theirs. So in an effort to continuously improve our customer-facing programs, we're going to encourage feedback from all of the participants today about how we did, and the relevance and depth of the information covered, as well as suggestions for future programming. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Mr. Kevin Cope. A little background on Kevin. He started his career at Treatolite, division of Petrolite, uh, where he focused on wastewater treatment, oil demulsification, and oil processing chemicals. Then he joined Dearborn Chemical as a senior wastewater specialist, where he was responsible for marketing, training, and technical support of the Eastern U.S. sales force. He eventually joined Calgon Corporation as a senior sales engineer, focusing on cooling water and boiler water treatment, and eventually managed their technical training program. Most recently, Kevin was with Chimera and held roles in product management and business development. Drawing on his years of practical experience with cooling water and boiler applications, Kevin developed a deep understanding of, of this technology <clears throat> in many forms. At Brentag these days, Kevin's an application specialist. He focuses on our customers uh, delivering technical knowledge and support for a water additives business. He also helps to develop our product portfolio, which we build solely around the needs of our customers. Kevin resides in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with his wife, Ruth. So we'll attempt to save time at the end of today's program for some Q&A. Uh, in, in the event you have a question that uh, we don't get to because of time, Kevin is going to provide his contact information so you can email him your question. Also, a PDF version of today's presentation will be made available to the participants on request. So, we're very pleased to have Kevin present today's topic on oily waste treatment. Kevin, take it away. Ryan, thank you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to uh, uh, presenting this topic for everyone today. Um, this is a series that we've put together. This is our third that we have also presented in the past, the heavy metals removal and anti scalants but today we'd like to focus on oily waste treatment. Some of the topics we'll be discussing today will include application roadmap, types of emulsions, coagulation, flocculation, demulsifiers, the types of oils, environmental tests, treatment approaches, and conclude with any questions you may have. Kind of date myself here a bit, but uh, in 1978, I started, as Brian mentioned, with Triolite, primarily in the oil industry, and did some work up in the Michigan area in the uh, automotive plants. And during that time, about a year into my career, I had heard about this kind of this thing called the Windsor process, and the Windsor process, the Windsor process, and everybody mentioned it. I became somewhat enamored to learn a little more about this, and uh, I thought it was kind of you know, it's kind of a special project, project uh, process, but come to find out that the Windsor process started in 1979 uh, by Ford was simply taking a oily waste coming off an automotive plant, reducing the pH down to between two and three using sulfuric acid, and then, ra and then adding aluminum sulfate or calcium chloride, and then raising the pH up to 8.5 using caustic. Well, the reason the pH was lowered to two to three was to remove, to have free oil break out. And then adding the aluminum sulfate and raising the pH was then to break the remaining part of the emulsion. Now, I will say that my, during my career, I'd only ever seen the aluminum sulfate alum being used, but apparently they also could be using calcium chloride. This is really started my, my interest in the oil and oily waste and treating oily waste and really, really found it fascinating. But if we were to define what an emulsion is, an emulsion is really part of a broader category known as a colloid. In other words, finely dispersed particles or oil into some kind of solution such as water. 
everything is considered a, col a colloid, but in the case of two liquids mixing together, um, two immiscible liquids mixing together, that's known as an emulsion. And an emulsion can have what's called a continuous and a um, uh, uh, dispersed phase. And I'll go through that in a moment. Um, but unlike uh, uh, a colloid, uh, uh, suspended uh, a colloidal uh, suspension, emulsion has two liquids. A colloidal suspension has solids and a liquid mixed together. Some examples of emulsions can be vinaigrettes, milk, mayonnaise, metalworking fluids, cutting fluids. And for these emulsions to be stable, something like a surfactant needs to be present. And then a surfactant has a water-loving end, and then either a water-hating or an oil-soluble end that really creates what the, what the uh, what we call as an emulsion, stabilizing the oil particles once they're in the solution. So if you could imagine, we had oil and water. Oil and water, as we all know, just doesn't mix. But if we were to add a surfactant to that oil, what we can have happen is allow this this oil now to be emulsified or mixed within the water, creating an oil emulsion. So there are two types of emulsions that we talk about in our industry, oil and water. And in this case, water is the continuous phase, meaning there's more water. Oil is the dispersed phase. Then there's also water in oil. Oftentimes this is called a reverse emulsion, but really the understanding is that oil is the continuous phase, being more oil, and water being the dispersed phase. And again, oil and water, oil is mixed with water under high energy in the presence of surfactants or wetting agents, creating emulsion. Water is the continuous phase, meaning there's more water. Oil is the dispersed phase, and oftentimes there are solids present in this emulsion mixture. And where we see these, really any industry that uses or generates oil, the auto industry, metalworking, food, oil, refining, oil refineries and such. Conversely, water in oil, large amounts of oil and trapping water droplets, usually through some kind of contamination, and again, these aren't perfect, this isn't a perfect world, so solids oftentimes are very present in these emulsions. Again, oil is a continuous phase where oil is the, there's more oil and water is the dispersed phase. And again, where we see these, oil refining or re-refining, oftentimes in the food industry, auto industry, any industry that skims oil off of an application. And the water oil and solids phase after treatment of an oil and water emulsion. This is a graph and chart that I like to use primarily for all wastewater treatment discussions. And what I call this is the application roadmap. And this uses, I use this to kind of mentally picture where everything is at in the wastewater area. We, we are confronted with two types of problems we need to resolve. We have soluble material, and we have insoluble material. And so any of the soluble material, for us to remove it through some kind of mechanical system, we need to make that material insoluble. And we do that either by precipitation, biological removal, or complexing. And by doing these, we create potentially a very, very fine particle in the water known as a colloidal suspension, or an emulsion, very, 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 very fine, oil droplets dispersed throughout the water. We resolve a colloidal suspension or an emulsion by a step called coagulation. And we'll go through coagulation in a moment. After we go through coagulation, we produce a larger particle size. I'm calling this either suspended solids or oil. Now these particles will rise or settle on their own, but typically take a very long time to rise or settle and really are not conducive to use in our industry or in the, ap the applications and equipment we have. Should also be noted though, when we go through the steps for a soluble material, we can either, we can make a larger particle, again, which will settle on its own, but not to the speed that we want to have this occur. 
Now we have these particles that won't settle out rapidly enough. We do what are called flocculation. And using flocculation, if we're using a colloidal suspension without oil, we create a sludge. And if we're breaking an emulsion, we create oily waste where oil breakers are needed to resolve that. So it's a chart that I have used for years, developed many, many years ago. And I, if I find it personally find it helpful to get my thought process around what I'm trying to do when I'm treating any kind of waste, be it a soluble waste, an emulsion, suspended solids, things along this line, understanding where the process is. Now, if we look at emulsion, typically we'll have small particles of oil, droplets of oil, that are dispersed throughout the liquid, in this case, water, water being the continuous phase. And these oil droplets are dispersed either through charge, repulsion on each one of the product, uh, particles or droplets, or a surfactant bond that is preventing them from coming together, emulsifying them into water. So what we need to do to resolve an emulsion is to break those bonds or neutral and or neutralize the charges. And by doing this, we're allowing the particle, the droplets of oil to come together to coalesce to become larger, thereby making what we call or known as a pin flock, a larger particle size that will settle out on its own or rise in the case of an emulsion on its own, but typically not fast enough for our equipment to get it out in a typical wastewater process. So what we do is we then take these particles or these droplets of oil and add a flocculant. And what the flocculant does is to draw them together, making larger particles, and then allowing them to rise more rapidly out of our solution. And that's a very, very good example. On the bottom right-hand side, you'll see very clear water with a well-defined oil scum on the top. So if we simply, if we simply look at the uh, application roadmap using it strictly for emulsions, we have an insolu insoluble emulsion, finely dispersed particles in water. We then resolve that using coagulation, making pin flock or suspended oils, which again will rise on their own, but not rapidly enough. We then flocculate the material and we create an oily waste. So the application roadmap going strictly, going strictly for the um, uh, uh, what emulsion looks like, how we resolve an emulsion. This is a great photo, I think, of showing a before and after. On the before, we have a a, a metalworking fluid, uh, some kind of a of a cutting fluid, metalworking fluid, um, where we've actually treated in this case with an organic polymer, creating very clear water and an oil layer, oil, excuse me, oil layer on top. So it's a great example of what, what we can do as far as treating these highly, highly um, uh, uh, oily waste uh, waters that we, uh, that we see. Now let's talk about the types of oils that we will see in our industry. Free oil, emulsified oil, soluble oils, synthetics, semi-synthetics, and oil-coated solids. What, we, what free oil is, is basically various sized droplets of oil that are not, not emulsified, usually very small. And these droplets will separate naturally over time without any chemical or physical enhancement. You hear the term emulsified oil. Small oil droplets that are held or emulsified in water by surfactants, wetting agents, and or solids. Soluble oils. Oils, when mixed with water, create an emulsion. Manufactured soluble, manufactured soluble oils have surfactants and wetting agent packages used to create a stable emulsion. These metal working oils, when mixed with water, are designed to lubricate and remove heat from the process. I was taught long, long ago that these, 
the lubricants, these uh, metalworking fluids work to lubricate. But the oil is a very, very good mechanism for quickly getting a heat source off of a tool or off of some kind of production. And water is very good for dispersing that heat. So really getting three-fold um, action with these metalworking fluids, the lubrication, the ability to quickly remove heat, and then the use of water to adequately disperse that heat from the uh, production source. Synthetic oils or lubricants consisting of chemically made compounds that are artificially made or synthesized. And then you also hear the term semi-synthetic. Um, semi-synthetic are blends of mineral oil and no more than 30% synthetic oils designed to have many of the benefits of the synthetic oils without the matching cost of the synthetic oils. And I found this out that semi-synthetics were invented, they were introduced rather back in the 1960s, actually 1966. And then lastly, uh, we can never get away from this, but oil-coated solids. Um, just about every emulsion or reverse emulsion that I've ever worked with has small amounts of dirt, metal shavings, biological masses, all coated or attached to the oil and water and need to be understood that those are there. Some of the types of, of applications that we see, naturally refineries, steel mills, automotive plants, anywhere metal working is done, oil and gas operation, food plants is an excellent source for oily waste, industrial laundry is another great source for uh, oily waste. I always put down uh, railroad diesel houses, many people don't realize, but oftentimes when they're cleaning the diesel engines, they get a lot of oil from rust or from dirt on the engine and a lot of oil from the diesel. And it's a great source for um, oily waste treatment uh, to, be, uh, to be needed. And again, there are many, many others where um, oily waste uh, is present. So some of the treatment approaches that we see in our industry, again, we're going to talk first about oil and water. Again, oil being the dispersed phase and, can, and the water being the continuous phase, more water than oil. We see batch treatments. We see the use of dissolved air flotation, the use of induced air flotation, oil separators such as plate separators, and API separators. Um, early on in my career, I learned that API separators stood for American Petroleum Institute, and they were basically nothing more than a wide spot in a line that calculations were done based on the oil size, the particles of oil and or the solids, and how big of a space based on the flow you needed to put in the line to take gross amounts of oil or solids out. So API separators, we have see rope, rope skimmers, we see disc skimmers, oil absorbents, be it ropes, be it uh, uh, mats, uh, uh, things along this line to absorb, uh, absorb oil. And there are many others um, used to remove oil from uh, the processes. Some of the environmental tests that we see, FOG, fog, fats, oil, and greases, TPH, total petroleum hydrocarbons, TTO, total toxic organics, TOC, total organic carbon, and turbidity. FOG basically is the use of hexane to extract the oil, then evaporate the hexane off and find uh, uh, the amount of oil left in the system, the amount of oil that was uh, in the water. Cautions really should be taken to make sure that none of the interferences uh, come out as oil. Um, back in uh, when this test first came out, instead of hexane, Freon was used. I had an account that uh, we had actually the water looked very similar to the water down here on the right, extremely clear water, but extremely high oil numbers. And we couldn't understand why we were getting such high oil numbers. And it turned out that there were a great amount of surfactants in the water. And we ran what was called an MBAS test, which distinguished surfactants and were able to understand the difference between oil and the water and the surfactants. So uh, I've been down the road where uh, these uh, components can give you uh, 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 
results you're not looking for based on contamination or based on the, uh, the, unit, the uh, material being in the water giving false positives in the tests that you're running. TPH is the portion of fog at fats, oil, and greases that is not animal or plant uh, uh, or uh, from plant or animal origin. Um, this is determined basically the same test, but then adding a silica gel. Again, interferences do occur with this test and should be noted when you're running the test or asking for the test of your own. TTO is total toxic organics. This is a list uh, by the EPA of organic proprietary. Uh, priority pollutants, um, pesticides, solvents, aromats, aromatic uh, benzene types compounds are part of this, and they are very, usually very, very restrictive in the amount of limits you're allowed to discharge. It can be present in we're working with oils. TOC, total organic carbon, a measurement of all organic carbon containing compounds in the water. This can be an indication of BOD and COD, biological oxygen demand and chemical oxygen demand. Um, if the ratio of three is relatively constant, the TOC can be used to determine the BOC and BOD and COD levels. And there are some really good online uh, monitors now for looking for uh, TOC in our waters. Another thing that's oftentimes used is uh, for a very simple and quick and dirty test is a turbidity meter measures the clarity of the water, used to uh, use as an indirect measurement of flawed fats, oil, and greases. NTUs, JTU, and FTUs are some of the units that are used. The surface scatter turbidity meters tend to work very, very nicely and not uh, have the problems that the many of the old units had with the oil, um, you know, plating out on the, on the probes and things along this line. Oil can be very, very nasty, and uh, the surface scatter turbidity meters work very, very well for keeping up. Uh, uh, the turbidity in check uh, when the oil is present. Let's talk a little bit about removing the oil from the water. pH depression, cationic organic coagulants, inorganic salts, clay-based products, and anionic flocculants. First, we're going to talk about the use of acids, also known as acidulation. Basically, what that is, is for highly emulsified oils, any kind of surfactant or wetting agent is present. Using a very strong acid, usually sulfuric or hydrochloric, you lower the pH and you bombard the emulsion and those, those uh, bonds with the H ion, breaking those emulsions. Um, here it says usually reduce the pH to 3.8. .8. I've seen it go down as low as 2 to break this. Um, and these act to neutralize the, uh, the charges we just talked about. Um, you're, in essence, breaking the emulsion. And the low pH can liberate free oil, even if it doesn't totally break the, uh, break the emulsion. Um, it's my belief this is a nice first step. Um, it's, I've, I've rarely seen it totally break some of the very, very tight, very tough emulsions. But it's a good first step to get a lot of the free oil out, break as much as possible and thereby cutting down on the amount of polymer or inorganic chemistries you need for the next step. Cationic organic polymers, they're excellent for tight and loosely emulsified oils. Again, the surfactants and the wetting agents are present. Um, the cationic polymers act to neutralize the, um, the particles that are surrounding the, the, the charges surrounding the oil droplets. They also help to break that bond, that surfactant bond. The cationic polymers tend to work very well at a lower pH, say 5.5 to 7, as opposed to higher pH. Um, some of the very, very highly emulsified oils may actually take two cationic organic polymers to work. I've seen that work very, very nicely. The use of two organic polymers, one to uh, destabilize the emulsion, the next cationic to uh, actually break the emulsion. And uh, the chemistry of these products this is my belief has as much to do with the chemistry of the coagulant as it does with the neutralization process. I've seen many applications where you think you're simply neutralizing the charge, but you find a different organic polymer works much better. Um, again, I, I, I truly believe this, that the chemistry of the organic coagulants has as much to do with breaking emulsions as their ability to neutralize charge. 
The use of inorganic salts is another me mechanism for breaking emulsions. They typically, they will create a, hydro a hydroxide flock. They tend to be used more and generally in treating oily waste. Um, they can be used successfully with organic compounds or coagulants, and they can also be blended with organic polymers to create a great treatment program. They typically will require an anionic flocculant to be successful, and overfeeding can create bulking, sending the oil to the bottom. So great care needs to be taken that you don't overtreat with a uh, inorganic salt. Another mechanism for treating oily waste is the use of clays. The clay tends to physically absorb the oil. Um, typically, large, oil, large sludge volumes are created when using clays. Um, typically, an anionic flocculant is needed. They can be difficult to feed, but they can also, very similar to the inorganics and maybe actually more prevalent, they can actually bulk the sludge, causing the oils to go to the bottom. But one of the positive things with clays is if you have a waste that has a fairly high solids content and a relatively low oil content, and you're going to dewater that waste after you take it out of the water, the clays tend to work a little better helping with dewatering, keeping the filter, filter claws on whatever press you're using from blinding. So the clays do have a nice, nice position if you have an oily waste that needs to be dewatered as opposed to breaking oil on it. And we'll go through the oil breaking steps here in a moment. So just to reiterate, we've started out with an emulsion. We've coagulated it using either a uh, organic coagulant, an inorganic coagulant, uh, clays, things along this line, or potentially blends of products. We then potentially will flocculate it using an anionic or cationic polymer making larger flock in the case of emulsion, breaking an emulsion so it rises much more rapidly, giving us better removal. And once we've removed that, we've come down to what I call oily waste, where things like oil breakers are used to clean these materials up, to clean this waste up. So let's talk about removing water from oil and the treatment approaches for those. Again, just to go back, we're going to be talking about water in oil. Again, large amounts of oil with water droplets. And believe me, more often than not, solids are present. Oil is a continuous phase, meaning there's more oil than water. Water is dispersed. And where we see these are re-refinery, anywhere oil is skimmed off of an industry. And these tend to produce two types of emulsions. Reverse emulsions, loose emulsions, phase separations very occurs very, very easily. There's very, very weak bond holding them together. And salad dressing is an excellent, excellent example of a loose emulsion. And then we have what are called tight emulsions. Phase separation does not occur rapidly. There's a strong bond holding the emulsion together. Usually emulsified agents are present. And peanut butter is an excellent example of a tight emulsion. I circled this here because I wanted to talk a little bit here about what's going on. Uh, if you think about our industry, we focus on wastewater. Well, there's folks who are making these oils and they're focusing on making a better product. How can I keep my oil in solution longer? How do I keep it from breaking down? How do I repel tramp oil once it gets in? So what they're constantly doing, you're looking for better, better surfactant packages, better wetting agent packages, better packages to keep their emulsified soluble oils in solution to do a better job on one of the metal workings or whatever their product is being used for in a plant. Conversely, we as wastewater folks have to now get better and better and better at breaking those bonds that the manufacturers have created. So the harder they make and the better they make their products, the more diligent we need to be in coming up with products to break those bonds. Now, if we have the water in oil emulsions, the treatments for them are the use of water and oil demulsifiers, also known as reverse demulsifiers, also known as wetting agents. Heat is used, water is used, acid can be used, 
anionic or cationic emulsions could be used, silicates are used, and others are used. And you're probably sitting there saying, okay, well, I just took water, I just took the uh, the oil out of the water, why do, I want to, why do I want to put water back in? Well, I've seen times when you have a waste oil that is very, very high in solids and maybe a small amount of water. By adding water, we can do what we call water wash the solids. In essence, wash the solids out of the waste oil. Um, I've seen that being used very, very effectively. I've seen, I've seen anionic emulsions being used to break the, uh, the solids and the water out of oil. And the anionic emulsions at times can actually create a tighter rag layer. We'll go through rag layer here in a moment. Silicates are used, uh, basically used for, um, again, kind of washing solids out of the water. The real workhorses, though, are the water and oil demulsifiers, which really repel solids and water from the, uh, from the oil and also the wetting agents, which tend to wet the solids and allow them to separate more easily out of the oil. So we, are, we have the, inorgan the organic demulsifier treatments. They consist of demulsifiers, wetting agents, and their surfactants, basically to repel the water and the solids out of the clean oil. These processes work better when heat is applied heat upwards up between 160 and 180. The heat helps with separation. It can produce a cleaner oil. It creates less rag layer, what are called oil wet solids, and also a tighter rag layer. Now, if you look on the pictures on the right, the bottle, uh, it's very difficult to see, but it's a three-phase break. There's water, rag, and oil. So I came up with this kind of uh, drawing, kind of a pictorial of what you're seeing there. You have clean oil on the top, rag layer in the center. And what rag layer is, is oil wet solids. The solids still have oil around them. Then you have clean water on the bottom. And then in some cases, you have what are called bottom solids or solids that are water wet, very little or less oil on those. And the key here is to make very clean oil produce a very small rag layer because that's in essence what you're trying to get rid of then. Clean water so it can easily be processed or discharged and also bottom solids again that can be processed and discharged. So the bottom solids um, effectively are water wet solids. You need to get rid of those and you try to produce a cleaner water. You try to produce clean oil, small amount of rag and clean water when doing the demulsifier treatments treating the water and oil emulsions. So let's talk about some conclusions. There are many, meth many available methods to treat water and oil and oil emulsions. What's right for your system really comes down to what type of oils and what kind of applications you have. Fluid manufacturers continue to improve formulas, making tighter emulsions, meeting harder wastewater challenges, basically keeping us in business, giving us new challenges on a daily basis on how to get oil out of water. Jar testing for oil and water emuls oil and water emulsions and bottle testing for water and oil emulsions can typically yield pretty reliable results. I'm very, very confident when I run jar tests um, I can find a solution and I know I can probably, or not probably, I know I can duplicate that in the plant because with oils and the bottle test, these tests tend to be very, very uh, repeatable. And this is really a key, and this goes without saying with any real wastewater application. Tests at various times in various situations determine a treatment program. Um, I had an account once that uh, literally one day the wastewater would be blue and this primarily was oil wastewater would be blue and the next day it'd be red and then 20 minutes later it'd be yellow. And we found that we had to test uh, over about a month period of time to really come up with an adequate treatment program. Uh, we looked at it after a weekend, be after clean out. We looked at production surveys or production schedules to find out which products cause us the most problems. So we knew how to adjust or needed to adjust our program under just about every circumstance that was available. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have the greatest uh, equalization. That's another topic, but um, test at various times to make sure that you find treatment programs that are indeed suitable to your application. 
beware of system upsets that can cause problems. You know, uh, we've all heard, no, we've not changed products, and lo and behold, they have changed. So be aware of the production. Um, look for any new cleaners that are brought into the plant. Um, new cleaners can really play havoc with uh, taking oil out of water, tighter emulsions, tighter uh, 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 tighter uh, 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 emulsions that need to be resolved. So be aware of that. Stay in communication with the uh, internal workings of the plant, making sure that there are no changes or when changes occur, you're aware of those. Check the equipment. Um, check the proper uh, DAF air pressure. Make sure the DAF is running properly. Um, batch treatment. Check for mixed times and energies. Um, it's been my opinion that when treating an emulsion, the coagulation step of emulsion, you really can't have too much mixing. I, I personally have never seen shearing occur when using a coagulant, an organic coagulant, for breaking emulsions. Um, I've seen shearing when using flocculants. But when breaking an emulsion, it's my personal opinion that you can't get enough mixing energy to really adequately break the, uh, make, break the emulsions. When you're doing a uh, water and oil, make sure you have the proper temperature, not too high, not too low. Another little trick is look for steam leaks. Um, a lot of times these uh, water and oil treatment tanks will have a steam coil in them. And uh, that leaking steam can actually add to the water in a form that you're trying to take out very, very fine droplets. I have seen customers use, use live steam. I'm personally more of a fan of the steam coils as I am with uh, uh, live steam injection and for fear and also with the coils looking out for steam leaks. Another thing to consider is consider flocculants to speed up the separation and that can also improve clarity. Um, I've, I've oftentimes seen a small amount of anionic fed after the flock is uh, is uh, been the flocculation has occurred, the pin flock has been has been created. A little bit of anionic polymer tends to really tighten that flock, making for a tighter sludge, a cleaner water, and improving clarity. It oftentimes works very very well. And then this is really kind of really a hot topic in our industry. Consider reusing the water or reusing the oil. Um, right now, that's really a hot topic and a hot. Uh, a button in our industry, the use and the reuse of water and also the reuse of oil. So that really concludes my presentation for today. Uh, I'd be willing and be, be happy to answer any questions that might come up. And if I don't get to your questions, uh, you know, there is my email address and my cell phone. Um, you know, feel free to uh, contact me either way and see if I can answer. And Brian, I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, a few questions have popped up here. Um, I'll, I'll uh, go over the ones that we saw with the greatest frequency. Um, first question would be, let's see here, what's the, what's the typical discharge limit for FOG? Um, you know, that's a tough one because it can vary, you know, widely, but for the most part, what I'm hearing, and uh, we just had a meeting last week and had some discussions, about 100 parts per million FOG seems to be kind of where everybody, you know, kind of agrees that that's typical. But again, it can be higher, it can be lower. But for the most part, uh, rule of thumb, we usually go with about 100 ppm. Okay. Uh, next question. Um, are there any differences in the types of oils that need to be removed? Uh, excellent. Excellent question. Uh, yeah, if, if you look at the picture that's up here now on the top right, um, that is an emulsion from some kind of a metal working application. Um, you know, it's, um, it could be a cutting application, a rolling application. Those tend to be very, very tightly emulsified oils that need to be treated. Those tend to have dosage rates even as high as 5,000 parts per million of organic chemistries anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 parts. So those oils really are very, very difficult and can require large, large amounts of chemistries. Conversely, oils, say in a food plant, a refinery, the more, I don't want to use the word loosely emulsified, but there, there's really no uh, sense that they're trying to keep that oil in solution. Those tend to be a little easier. Typically the same chemistries can work on both, 
but the dosage rates tend to be considerably lower, anywhere from maybe 20 to 150 ppm. So it really depends on the type of oil. But um, yeah, it really boils down to you know what kind of application. When you're talking metalworking fluids, your dosage rates can be extremely high. Whereas again, refineries, steel mills, food plants, um, they they tend to be uh, be, be considerably lower. Okay, a couple of people wanted to know what's the difference between a, a DAF and an IAF? Well, the IAFs are probably things of dinosaurs. So, but DAF stands for dissolved air flotation. And what you're doing there is you're pressurizing water and then allowing that water to come out of pressure and release oxygen or release air. And as that air is released, you get a very, very fine bubble that comes at the top. Um, Brian mentioned I live in Pittsburgh. So periodically in the spring and in the fall, when I open up my, my faucet, I get this white haze. If it sits long enough, that's just air in the lines because if, if the, the line has gotten under pressure and that air comes out and it rises to the top and that's really what a DAF unit is. IAF stands for induced air flotation, typically used in things like refineries. Um, what they are is, uh, if you can imagine an, an egg beater and it's going and also used very prevalently in the mining industry, but not necessarily for Wall Street. But it, in essence, what they are, if you can think of an egg beater, and as it spins rapidly, you create a vortex and you suck air down and that egg beater breaks that air bubbles and those air bubbles then separate and rise to the top, grabbing a hold of the oil particles and bringing those to the top. So induced air tends to be very large bubbles. Dissolved air tends to be very, very fine bubbles. Hope that, hope that answers. Okay, um, another question is how long do you, quote, cook the oil uh, in a water and oil bottle test? Um, well, when I started in this industry, I usually said I used to use and let them set overnight. But I learned my lesson that uh, some of the things you want to do is uh, put them in, maybe check them every 15 minutes, anywhere from, you know, 90 minutes to two, three hours. Um, you don't want to screw the tops on tight. You want to make sure that the tight tops are loose. Uh, I've had that problem. I, again, learned lessons there. But really, anywhere, I would guess anywhere from maybe 90 minutes to the maximum of two hours. But uh, like I said, when I started with Triolite, um, we were told, uh, let them sit overnight, you know, put them out at five in the afternoon and check them eight tomorrow morning. But for the most part, you can see reactions anywhere from 90 minutes to two hours. Thanks. Um, and this one popped up several times. Uh, is there any way to determine if you, and I'm paraphrasing because the same question was asked several different ways, but basically, is there any way to determine if you have a water and oil or an oil and water emulsion? I wish uh, that one, that one's a little more difficult. I, I guess the best way I would answer that would be just visually look at it, pour it. Um, you know, if it, if it tends to look like water, it's probably a oil in water emulsion. If it starts to become more, like I guess the word thicker, um, you might be on the verge of, an, of a water and oil. Um, I've seen, even though something is thick, uh, you might still have more water, but it tends to act more like a, a, a water and oil emulsion. That's kind of a hard one. Um, you know, you can centrifuge it out and really find out exactly what you have to see where you're at. But I guess rule of thumb would be, just kind of pour the solution out. And if it's liquidy, you know, more like water, you tend to have oil in water. And if it tends to be more thick, you know, like a syrup, you tend to maybe have more of the water in oil. Okay. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, we have time for one more here. Um, any, uh, okay, yeah, any typical dosage rates for organic polymers? Uh, yeah, back um, for organic polymers, again, if you're looking at things like refineries, steel mills, food plants, uh, you know, maybe, you know, low of 10, high of 100, 150, 200. Um, if you're looking at the, the metal, true metal working fluids um, being in a rolling mill, a, a wire drawing compound, uh, uh, cutting, uh, uh, things along this line, uh, metal fabricating. 
where the oil looks more like a milk. If you can recall that picture I had up a while back, but the water looks like a, more like a milk. Those tend to be upwards, maybe 500, and I've seen them as high as 5,000. Um, so it really depends on the type of oil. So rule of thumb for the looser emulsions where they, you know, you can kind of see through the water, maybe down 20 to 150 ppm of organic chemistries. You start getting those milky white looking materials. Again, on the slide, the top right would be one of those. You're looking at maybe anywhere from 500 to 5,000. All right. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so I think that's about all of our time. We're about a minute over our schedule right now, but uh, uh, if anybody would like to have a copy of the presentation that was delivered today, please email Kevin at the email address you see there on your screen. And if any of our guests today have questions that uh, perhaps require a little bit more in-depth consultation, feel free to reach out to Kevin and we'll schedule some time uh, to do that for you. Um, but uh, uh, beyond that, that's our presentation today. I want to thank uh, all the people that attended. I think this was a record attendance for, uh, for one of these webinars, so I appreciate everybody taking their time and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.